going to call our president, our doctor in residence, Marcus Oginski, to come and share some words. So as I was um, coming up here to the podium, I had a little flashback moment there. I also took the long way around, which is my mistake. <laughs> Um, so, to the last time I gave the speech from, uh, from this podium, um, and I'm not talking about last year, because last year I was just staring at a big white circle of lights. I was, I was thinking back to two years ago, when I thought it would be a great idea, before I started speaking, to pause and let you guys, you know, wish a good yantif to your neighbors. And ten minutes later, I had to wrestle the room back, because you all wouldn't stop talking. So, thankfully, we don't have to do that this year. So that means I get like, what, like extra 10 minutes on the clock, right? No? No? All right. So you're probably wondering what your doctor president is going to talk about this year. What could possibly be on my mind? Uh-oh, he's going to talk about COVID. <laughs> I'm actually so sick of talking about COVID. Everywhere I go, every conversation I have finds its way back to COVID. I would love to not talk about COVID today, but unfortunately, I'm going to talk about COVID. I was told that when I started this job as president, don't worry, it's okay if you don't know what you're doing. Board presidents always focus on what they're good at anyways. I thought, great, I'm good at doctoring. Since when does a synagogue need a doctor? <laughs> well, at least there's a silver lining of the pandemic that for the last two years, I actually looked like I knew what I'm doing. So beyond the medical conundrums and challenges this virus has caused, I've been intrigued to watch the social effects on our society. Early in the pandemic, when the lockdown started, fear and anxiety were the primary emotions. Ironically, the fear at the time was markedly out of proportion to the prevalence of virus in our community. The response at the time was to join together as one community. We would get through this lockdown together. Let's all stay home to protect our neighbors. Commercial advertising focused on community and camaraderie. Healthcare workers were heroes, and people would clap and cheer and howl for us every night. As the lockdown dragged onward and second and third waves appeared, the tone of the nation and the people around us changed as well. Terms like COVID shaming started to appear. People had to wonder if their friends were being socially promiscuous. Remember that term? That's when you thought you were safe with the, when that's when the people who you thought were safe were now venturing outside of your pod and cohort and exposing you to more of the outside world than you were ready for. The tone shifted from what we need to do to what I need to do for me. The pandemic has been hard on me. I deserve to take a break. Advertising reflected this growing self-centered attitude of the nation. Increasingly, we see ads for massages, entertainment, and travel that focus on celebrating your self-sacrifice and rewarding yourself. Advertisers are also picking up on the fact that the pandemic generated about one trillion in unspent disposable income across America. The selfless spirit of lockdown was quickly replaced by the selfish needs of a deprived American public. If you need more proof, just watch the drivers on our roads right now or watch a viral video of an irate airline passenger. Unfortunately, we see the spirit all around us today and Americans have quickly returned the focus to I and me. At the beginning of the pandemic, when we were preparing our hospitals for the first wave, Heather and I decided that it was best if the family was physically separated from me, the hospitalist. They went away to Florida for the first month. In April, when they were returning, I was at the airport terminal waiting to pick them up. I was standing there in a fabric mask that Heather had made when a woman approached me and said in a derisive tone, does that mask make you feel any safer? I responded, oh, you misunderstand. This mask isn't for me, it's for you. She shot me an annoyed look and walked away and clearly didn't understand that I had been in the hospital doing a job that carried a six-fold increased risk of getting severe COVID illness. I was wearing a mask to protect the airport from me. This is why we are wearing masks even today. These masks aren't to protect you, they are to protect your neighbor from you. We wear them as a communal responsibility in case we are spreading the illness asymptomatically. We see this in vaccination attitudes as well. While a majority of Americans have taken advantage of our incredible and safe vaccines, we are startled by those who outright refuse them. NPR recently ran a story about anti-vaccination attitudes. 
In this article, they simply played a series of unbiased interviews with random individuals who had refused the vaccine. They asked very few questions and simply let the people tell their story. There were no confrontational questions, no pushing, and no rejection of the explanations given. My disappointment with the story is that the reporters didn't draw together any conclusions for those who had missed the themes of these examples. All of the subjects portrayed their choice as a personal choice. I didn't get the vaccine. It isn't right for me. I don't think I need it. I think I will be fine if I get COVID. What they missed is that vaccination strategies are only partially about protecting the individuals. The true point of most vaccine strategies is about protecting the community as a whole, and the community as a whole protects those few individuals who medically can't be vaccinated or for whom the vaccine simply doesn't work. This is the true spirit of vaccination and is the meaning behind herd immunity. But unfortunately, I see this message missing in most of our advertising. Vaccines are about protecting the community, but so often the message is lost because of selfish concerns for me or selfish disregard for the communal we. So how do we, on this Day of Atonement, move forward in the midst of this newly empowered selfishness? What is the antidote for this worship at the altars of I and me? The answer is here. Here in a community that focuses on social justice, on supporting our neighbors and tikkun olam. This is a congregation of action, of doing, and of participation. We have 320 member families, but we have over 300 actively engaged member families. Even large, well-funded synagogues would feel lucky to have 300 active member families. Around here, we get things done. We figured out this live stream business, and we have provided hundreds of hours of services directly into our homes, including all of you who are watching right now. We supported and continue to support those who need to avoid indoor spaces and those who continue to be engaged remotely. This effort has required hundreds of volunteer time, expertise, and frankly, some cold, hard cash. Throughout the pandemic, our team of volunteers have checked in with our stranded and lonely members. We have provided meals and made personal deliveries to our community members in need. The Road Faith Sedic team has been literally sending emails or calls every day. Rabbi Coburn and our mental health team have looked after the welfare and supported our members and others stressed by the anxiety and pressures of these times. Volunteers planted the memorial garden out front, and donations from many of you made it possible. This beautiful garden also added ADA accessible access to our other door. We need to be proud of what we do and what we can do in this congregation. Isaiah teaches us this very lesson in the Haftorah we are about to read. The fasting that we are currently doing is not the action that brings us closer to God. It is the actions and deeds that we do to protect our fellow humans and repair the world that brings us redemption. So why do we Jews ask for money for our synagogue on Yom Kippur? We do so because we know that our synagogues and our community are the instruments of Isaiah's message. This synagogue and this community can and does execute on Isaiah's formula for atonement. Supporting this community is more of a path to that atonement than the fast that is grumbling in our bellies right now. Supporting our communities is how we heal the selfishness this pandemic has created. Through your dollars today, we'll be able to continue providing programs to those who are safer at home, a daily minion for our mourners, emotional support to those who are struggling, dynamic programming that must be constantly reinvented and readapted to the COVID parameters of the day. This includes renting tents in our parking lot to provide a sheltered outdoor kiddish space and programming space for our youth programs during the high holidays. For those of you who haven't been to our property in many months, the maintenance that is constantly needed has not been paused during the pandemic. We have also been operating with our thinnest administrative staff ever. We desperately need to invest in more dynamic people who will foster the mission of Road of Shalom. Now is your opportunity to support your synagogue and your community who are executing in Isaiah's message for redemption. Now is your opportunity to push back on the I and me and selfishness of this pandemic with your support of a community that cares. Our pledge cards have returned this year to simplify giving for the congregants in the sanctuary right now. For those at home, there is a link on our website under High Holiday section. Look to the upper right-hand corner under High Holiday Donations. You can make a pledge there and be billed later. As I've done each year, if you are able, think about the pledge last year and consider doubling it. 
Don't be afraid to think about that $1 trillion in unspent disposable income when deciding on your pledge amount. This year, the highest tab is $3,600, and this is the tab that I'll be turning down this year. We will take a few moments to mark your cards, and then ushers will be circulating to collect them. Mr. Cox and Marcus, um, I just want to say a couple words, and then I'm going to actually ask Moshe to lead us in a nagoon while we're doing this. Um, I have never believed in a synagogue more than I believe in Red of Shalom.